Just like today's Darknet, back in the day, there was a more hidden part of the BBS world. This episode of Back to the BBS is the only part of the documentary series that specifically takes a look down history lane. Because the uprising of the first wave of the underground cyber culture was synonymous with BBSing, I thought it was valuable to reflect on where it all came from. Indeed, by visiting some modern day BBSs and on the internet, you can see the influences of this original wave are still present even today. In the heyday of BBSs, for every one legitimate public domain board, there was probably at least 10 more nefarious ones. Often, you had to be specially invited to be a member of a, an underground board or HPAV boards as they were known. HPAV was a term that became popular on BBSs. It stands for Hacking, Freaking, Anarchy and Viruses. Often, a C would be added at the end for cracking and or carding. A whole bunch of what would be termed as elite boards rose up that would cater to the HPAV counterculture. Dude, I, I remember, I, I loved it. I, I remember um, there was a sysop in, in Tennessee who ran a Wares BBS. That was the first time I'd ever seen one, but he, he ran like a real one. Like he was like a distro for a lot of these groups and stuff. And so he was like the only cat in town doing that. And I never got to, I was never like really affiliated, but I had, I hung out in IRC. I mean, I was in Razor 1911, but I didn't do anything. I just like, hung out, you know. Um, I loved, I just made friends with all these guys. And there was like an IRC channel for all these things. There was acid and ice and just like so much activity. I'd come home after school and like be on IRC and, you know, running my BBS. And, uh, you know, I just really, I really, really remember just being, feeling like, wow, there's this crazy underbelly scene out here. Like I had been doing BBSs for a long time, but it was like all, you know, call the Sierra BBS for help or call like this BBS and go just look at the cool art. And so when this local guy had this board, it was the first time it kind of was like exposed me to this underbelly side of it. And it, in that same period of time, that was when we were all getting into like 2600, like a, me, like a, another girl who's a, still one of my closest friends after many, many, many years. She and I used to go to the 2600 meetings at like Hickory Hall Mall in, in Nashville. And like, you know, try to like build a blue box and do all this stuff. Like we, we were into all of that and it was just so enticing and there was just so much activity. And it was like, kind of like, it really felt like a scene that was our own. Like if you were a young computer person, this was like the coolest place you could hang out. It wasn't AOL chat rooms, you know what I mean? And, and it was just kind of dangerous and like all this stuff. And then it, everybody got busted. My name is Dan. Uh, nowadays, I live uh, in Asia, but as a, as a teenager growing up, um, I lived in Western Europe. Uh, and it's probably many uh, teenagers my age back then. Um, you know, at some point we got a computer, which in my case was a Commodore 64 when I was 11 years old. Um, you know, did all the things that you would expect an 11 year old to do with that computer, copying games and, and so forth and so forth. Um, and when in 1989, Commodore announced its new flagship product, um, I got the Amiga. And that's really where I would say my scene life, if you can call it that, um, really started. It's when, when I got into my first little demo group, um, which basically was a guy I was, I was buying discs from, right? The guy around the corner who copied a game or two for me. Um, and they were in, in this small Amiga group that was over a couple of countries. And, you know, I, I sort of got introduced to that. Um, I probably did whatever teenager would do at that age, which is, yeah, I, I want to be part of this, you know, this, this underground thing, which, which obviously has, has this appeal. First appeal, obviously having, you know, the latest games. Um, so I did something, um, what you, what we refer to as mail trading, right? We, we basically started, copying the latest, then you'd, you'd send it over to friends or pen pals or whatever you wanted to call them, uh, mail contacts as we call them later, uh, across the world, most of them in Europe, probably, you know, Germany, Scandinavia were, were the popular countries. Um, and you'd send your discs and then they'll put new stuff on it and send it back to you. Now, 
obviously that implies you know you get your stuff as fast as the mail goes right <laughs> which in those days you know there's no way we could have afforded couriers so you're you're relying on the incumbent mail uh in in such country and look you know for me to send something to germany and get something back would take about a week right so i was in in a scene that was probably uh, a few days to a week old and one day um I have a new pen pal and he said him, he was in the country I was in and he sends me something brand new and I go, whoa, where did this guy get this so fast? And I, I got it. He's in the same country, but but still, right? Because these crack intros would have a date on them and it was like yesterday's date. I was like, where did this guy get this? Did, did he crack this? Right? So I wrote him a letter and I said, hey, where did you get this? And he writes back and he says, I bought a modem and I I'd heard of modems before. Um, I, I didn't have one myself. Um, like I said, pretty young. So I wrote back to the guy, hey, hey, you know, how does it work? Can I meet you? Um, so I took the train, went to where this guy lived, went to his house. He was one of these archivers. You know, I, I think today, if, if you go on, on one of the big Amiga archives, it's actually one of his archives that is there. When I met him, he had like 8,000 floppy disks. Right? So I was like, whoa. And so he had this device called uh, a modem. I go, like, oh, so, so what is this thing, right? And he's like, yeah, you know, phone line, and you call to a, a system called the BBS. Um, you can check a file list and you download the stuff. And there's such a thing as, as a ratio, right? For in order for me to download, you know, one, uh, three disks, I have to put one disk uh, up there. And I go, like, okay, so what's difficult about that? He's like, well, it's finding that one disk that, that BBS doesn't have or you're not entitled to get three disks down. Oh, okay. So we had a good symbiosis going in a sense that in those days, um, the, the few BBSs that were around, they had most of the, I would say the games, the, the stuff that was cracked, copyrighted back then, but it didn't have so much of what, what we call the demo scene. So I would give this guy the latest demos, which he would then upload and then he would get the latest games and then that kind of worked for us. And so, we had that relationship for probably a couple of months. And then obviously, you know, I had to get a modem, right? I mean, uh, there's no way I'm going to keep hopping on a train to see this guy and then spend an entire weekend, you know, uh, modem trading as we called it our, our, ourselves back then. I needed to get a modem. And so started looking at how much it cost and the then popular modem. Um, and I looked at it and a US Robotics, I believe it was called an HST. God forbid, I don't remember what the abbreviation stands for. But it was an, a 9600 baud modem, was about 1100 US dollars, um, plus taxes, plus shipping, plus you know what. So it was like twice what I paid for my Amiga, and I was like, yeah, <laughs> there is no way uh, one that I can afford that. Two, I can convince my parents to go buy that for me. So I probably did what many did, and I started off with a you know a modem, which was a hand me down, right, a 1200 baud modem. I was like, right, I'm online. Let's start. And so I asked my friend, you know, you got a couple of uh, numbers of BBSs, you know, where you're on and I can, I can get on. Right. So he gives me these numbers. I dial 1200 baht, not allowed <laughs> because uh, the modem was too slow and I would hog up the phone line too long for more uh, elite users. And therefore I wasn't allowed. Right. So the search continued. I found a 2400 baht modem for free. I was like, wow, right? I doubled. Welcome to the world of elites, right? So dial back that number. One of them allowed 2,400 users. Now, to put things in perspective, and I haven't done this calculation, but I, I think it's, it, it takes about an hour to download a disk at 2,400, a normal standard Amiga size disk. I think in the PC world, that would be roughly the same, slightly less, 700 something K, and an Amiga was about 800 K. And it took about an hour. So you see the point of not wanting 1,200 or 2400 baht modem. So I was doing that for a while uh, and then realized, uh, A, my mom wasn't very happy with me hogging the phone line. That was the easy part of the conversation. But the inevitable part of the conversation was, well, you know, um, this, this is costing loads of money and who's gonna pay for this? Hacking was the sense of being able to get access to a system you shouldn't get access to. Um, which in some cases could lead to the P freaking and freaking 
basically was everybody had phone bills that were racking up. Uh, there were more creative individuals that were looking at ways for those bills not to rack up uh, and stay zero, right? So they would look at wildly various methodologies of making sure that when you were making phone calls, BBSs or otherwise, that call would be free. Imagine the world where, I don't know how many there were, there, there are lists that you can find online, the global blacklist, I think it's called, where you can see all of these old names and the phone numbers and what have you. I think there must have been four or 500 top piracy uh, boards in the US at one stage. There probably were, were more in Europe as a whole, but if you break it down by country, probably roughly the same number. So imagine this world where all of these computers, you know, all these people were connecting, downloading stuff, uploading it somewhere else. And we're obviously um, using means to do that as cheap or free of charge, which was happened quite a lot. And so it, it just had to reach a peak where people would get into trouble. And um, two things went kind of hand in hand. Um, people were starting to step up or to climb down on piracy. It, it you know, the, the industry had matured. It was now a, a more formidable business. It was now worth looking at um, these big groups. You'd have law enforcement that started to cooperate across borders, which didn't happen before. Um, and at the same time, you'd have these big telco companies or other companies that were impacted by the individuals that were calling for free, basically <laughs> at their expense. And so this was all sort of bubbling to what I would call, you know, a big eruption that had to inevitably happen at, at some point. So what you will have seen is, in, for instance, uh, in Germany, um, the mostly used freaking methodology was Blue Box. Um, for those of you who don't have time or patience to look it up or don't know what it is, it basically means you call a toll-free number where there's an operator that is going to assist you to make a phone call into a certain country. You would basically fool the telephone switch into believing that you had hung up your phone line. You take over control of that switch and you route your phone call. And given you were toll calling a toll-free number, no charge was incurred, right? And this was by means of a certain frequency combination that you had to send down the line, which would then fool that switch into believing that you had hung up the line, whereas you're actually still there. So how do you have to physically visualize this? Guys with a phone, uh, a headset from a walk Walkman, connected to your computer, put it on your phone, and when was the right time, you'd hit a button and it would just send that frequency and you'd take control of that, um, of that line. Very popular methodology, very well detailed and, and described on the internet, very popular in, in, I would say, the scene in Germany. They started clamping down on that big time when a certain um, individual that now resides in New Zealand um, went on uh, national TV and explained how it was done, right? So you can imagine uh, that has not made that person very popular. <laughs> But, you know, overnight people, you know, they, they knew what was going on. People could be tracked as such. And a lot of people got in trouble or abandoned um, doing that on time. Top story this hour, New Zealand is at the center of one of the world's biggest internet piracy investigations. Breach of copyright offenses in the United States, money laundering. Gates are open. I think that the message is clear. Located target, safe room. Don't mess with the United States on copyright issues. Second story that comes to mind, and uh, in this case, we're talking about a French uh, national who ran some of the biggest groups on Amiga and then later on, on the consoles. Um, he was distributing the so-called calling cards. Now, a calling card is, is basically like a credit card that you get as a default as a, a US subscriber to a phone service. So let's say 
Uh, I live in the US and my long distance provider is AT&T. Uh, and I have a subscription with them. They will by default back in those days, give me a so-called credit uh, calling card, which I could use to charge phone calls to in the event I wasn't at home, right? Let's say I was a salesman, I was on the road and I needed to make a phone call from a hotel. I would use my calling card. Um, a calling card is basically your phone number that you had plus a four digit pin. So not very secure if you think about it in, in present day um, security perspectives. So these calling cards were massively used from Europe to make these illegal calls to the US. And in the early days, such a calling card allegedly, you know, would last you for about a week. You'd call for a week for free. And then that card would, what we called die, and you'd get another one. Um, but back to our French national, um, this was an individual that had found um, somebody, and this is detailed, they got convicted, right? Um, that worked at a big switch. And so this guy was just siphoning all these calling cards and saving them to a text file, selling them to that French national who would then sell them on, right? And, and so a calling card would be sold, you know, as expensive as $10 a piece to towards the very end, a dollar a piece. And they were selling thousands and thousands of them. And so this French national um, was lured to the US to do one last final big transaction. Right? And, and you know, it's basically entrapment. It's illegal in big parts of the world. It's not illegal in the US. But so you can almost imagine the, the spy movie where the guy arrives with a big suitcase of cash uh, gets off the plane thinking he's going to transact, you know, a, a, a text file on a disk and hand over the cash. Uh, the guy was was arrested by the FBI upon arrival in in, um, in the United States, and he served prison time, right? Um, he then, and and I don't have this as a fact. This this is hearsay. But started singing like a bird, as we would say, um, and that brought down quite a number of the big boards that were around because those boards were. Uh, marketplaces where these cards were being sold. Um, some of these people were involved in the actual sales of it. And so some of those large boards that I mentioned to you, you know, 10, 12, 15, 20 lines, they just went down, right? They got a visit, uh, all of their equipment seized. Um, I would say in most cases, that's where it ended for these individuals. They lost, they lost their equipment, probably got a conviction, but didn't do any jail time or anything like that, except for our French fellow. Um, but definitely interesting times at, at both sides of the pond, right? So there, there's a there's a moral to the story that you know whatever you do in the end it does catch up with you. And what's interesting to me is um, at least the country I lived in in Western Europe towards the end of 1997, right? So a year later when these big busts were occurring, you know the internet really picked up, and we all started using telnet <laughs> instead of. Um, you know, calling each other with actual phone lines. And so that whole world of, you know, having to hack, freak, use somebody else's credit card, calling card or, or whatever it was, that just went away. And it's, it's just silly to think that people got themselves into massive amounts of trouble. And, you know, had, had they, you know, had the world moved on a year later, that would have gone away, you know, naturally. So it's, it's, um, it's funny how these things change. Maybe again, the, the one thing you could do is, is say just the differentiation between a uh, PD board and an elite board, and what does elite mean? So maybe you could okay, just yeah, sure. Get the terminology there. Uh, look, uh, PD boards, I, I would say, or public domain boards, uh, were, were typically the individuals that uh, were as passionate about the platform as 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 anyone else, and that probably had a knack for technology and, and like, like to tinker around, um, but may not have had, you know, um, people that, that, that got their hands on, on the illegal stuff or not fast enough, or maybe, you know, they already had a moral compass at that point in time that told them like, look, I make, I make a choice not to be involved in that. And so they would typically run more the, these collections, right? I mean, it, it's hard to imagine, but back in the day, you'd have collections of pictures, you'd have collections of fonts, you'd have collections of mod files, you'd have collections that, that you'd have on a BBS. And let's not forget, right, a, a hard drive. When, when I got my first hard drive, we're talking 19, 
91, I got a 20 megabyte hard drive that uh, cost me half in US dollars, about 500 US dollars, right? So having space costs money. And so people would collect all of these things on, on sizable hard drives, which in those days were like three, four, 500 megs and make them available to other users who were looking for it so that you, kn you knew it was always there. And if you needed that data, you could go pick it up. Therefore, you wouldn't have to necessarily store it yourself. Um, and many of uh, public domain board would actually charge, would say, hey, you know, there's a subscription uh, involved for downloading. Um, and because you pay that subscription, it's one way traffic. You can download what you want. I don't expect anything back other than money. Flipping over to, to the dark side, if I can call it that, um, the interest was, was, was very different. You wouldn't want just about anyone to get access to your boards. So handles were used much rather than real names. Um, there were things like system passwords and new user passwords and what have you just to prevent from just about anyone being able to connect and get access. Uh, in many a case, you needed references, which meant you needed to show which other boards you were part of or whom you knew or somebody that actively uh, or an active user on that board that would actively refer you. That was the only way of getting into the closed community. Um, a lot of that had to do with, in some countries at that point in time, you know, having copyrighted material on, on your hard drive was already illegal and, and you know, would be persecuted. Um, other countries, less so. But that was the distinction in terms of gaining access. Um, the actual workings of, of, of a bulletin board that was sort of on the underground side of things. Uh, look, the majority of people were on what was called a ratio. And I, I sort of alluded to it earlier in, in the interview where I said, if you wanted to download three discs, you'd have to get one disc up there. Um, I can tell you that for the, the, the faster bulletin boards, that was a pretty daunting task, right? Because some of these boards were getting hundreds of calls a day would have up to a thousand users um, and they would have all the latest, right? So for you to find something uh, that they did not have so you could then download something else became very, very difficult. And that's where you needed to have multiple boards and checking all of them to make sure that you could trade things between them um, in two, so that in the end you would have what you wanted, right? Your, your downloads. Um, that kind of evolved as well. You got so-called traders who were probably never opened a single archive they downloaded. They just downloaded and uploaded it somewhere else and just kept looping that around. Some of them even, you know, back in the day, programmed a script on their terminal software that would just round robin uh, boards day and night and it would just auto trade. So that was happening as well. Um, I would say the bigger groups that I talked about earlier that had the faster boards, they were selling so-called leech accounts, right? And a leech account basically meant, hey, uh, I know you want, you just want to download. I know you won't be able to upload ever. And so similar to the public domain uh, boards, they would charge a subscription, right? And, and you'd pay anything like, I heard crazy numbers like 50 to a hundred dollars a month just to be able to download whatever you wanted as much as you wanted. So, and that was then used well, for a few things. One, to, to grow the BBS, similar to the public domain BBS. But some of those proceeds went to the group that then used it to buy games, to then crack, and it became self-sufficient, right? Because there was funding involved, obviously at some point. Um, what makes a board elite? It's, it's the whole sum of things that I just mentioned to you. The fact that you would have to know the in crowd in order to be allowed on the fact that you'd have to be able to put things on there that that board did not already have uh, and to be part of that crowd you were elite right or elite as, as it later became um, that group of people grew astronomically right so um, i would say in the beginning probably a couple of hundreds by the mid 90s we're talking about thousands of people right so it became less of a secret uh, what was going on there. And, it, and inevitably that led to the downfall, I already explained, right? People getting uh, arrested and, and getting into trouble. But that is, is what I would say is a distinction between your, your public domain boards <clears throat> and an elite board. It, it's not the software, it's, it's not what's going on. It's, it's 
the crowd that is on it, how you get on it, and what you're, you're expected to be doing that really defines the distinction between the two. Anarchy, what is now widely available on the World Wide Web, you know, how to build a bomb from a, a, you know, a steam cooker or what have you. You know, anyone can find that. Back then, that was in those you know, illicit little text files that would be spreading on, on, on the boards. Um, you know, when I ran my board, I had an HPAV conference and it had, had those you know, documents in there. Um, you know, most of them were for the, from the early 80s, <laughs> right? And somebody had typed them up. Uh, look, again, moral compass, uh, terrorism. Nobody realized, right? So it, was, it just seemed a cool thing to have. Uh, you'd, you'd had recipes on how to make drugs, right? LSD and, and, and how to grow weed and all of those things. Uh, look, to me, it was like, uh, you know, illegal literature is, is how I saw it. Virus, it wasn't a, I mean, we, we had viruses on, on Amiga, but it, it was more like a, a nuisance than true damage in most cases, right? It was more like uh, somebody tagging his name on your on your, your, your front door, right? I was here, okay, annoying, moving on. So it, 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 what, it, for sure they weren't the viruses that lead to malicious uh, things as they do today. Um, and as such, again, from where I'm coming from, the Amiga side, we were all hit with a virus. I was actually hit with a virus not too long ago on my emulator. I'm like, what, what is this? Why is this happening? I'm like, ah, virus. Let me install a virus killer. And <laughs> so for sure, it, it was something that existed, but it, it wasn't a major part of, of my life. So you mentioned there, um, you know, obtaining pirated games either via or what I've known as sneaker net, where you, you physically yeah. walk to somebody and, and hand them an empty floppy disk and get a copy of the one that they have, or then via yeah. um, modem. Now, like you also mentioned there, you have copy protection. So back in those days, yep. you know, those games, mainly games, but other things as well, had protection. So you, you couldn't just copy uh, the disk and, and it would work. You had some form of either physical or other sort of methods so that the game just simply couldn't be copied. First of all, could you just tell us um, what cracking is? And then uh, by extension of that, what a crack troll is? Look, as soon as there was software, there were people who were copying it. And as soon as people were copying it, um, you, you'd have the companies publishing it, looking at preventing it from being copied. And uh, th there's been all sorts of um, protection schemes. Uh, if you think in the realm of, of PC, most of the early PC games, you know, probably worked with, with you know, codes that were in a manual, that were, were put on a piece of paper that you couldn't photocopy or, or stuff like that. Um, on the Amiga system, you'd actually have um, physical protection, which meant you needed to put a dongle in your computer and only if the dongle was present could you run said game or they would have a particular uh, format of the disk that made it impossible for your run-of-the-mill Amiga disk drive to, to read and reproduce properly. And so when we're talking about cracking, it is about either circumventing or entirely removing the, pr the protection that prevents a disk or a medium from being reproduced. Um, and that goes back as far as we can imagine. Um, and typically what happened was, you know, somebody went to a store, bought a game, re removed or circumvented the protection, um, went to what was called a copy party, right? Where your sneaker net, right? Where a bunch of guys got together at a computer club over the weekend and they just exchanged the games they bought and, and, and that was it. Um, that kind of, um, I'm not gonna say professionalized, but people, you know, started understanding this this underground thing, and they started doing what you see in the graffiti world, right? They started tagging it, and a tag would be as simple, you know, in the early days, it would just be a text file that would be on a disk, and it said, uh, "So and so removed the protection or cracked the protection." Um, that moved on to in-game uh, messages, you know, where it used to say uh, "copyright by company, company, company." They would hex edit that out, and it would say. 
a game cracked by so and so. But eventually, it went to something which um, you know pe some people call crack throw, others will call intro. Uh, but it basically was a piece of code with a logo of a group, some catchy chip tune, and a scroller that would say. Hey, we're the greatest people on the planet, uh, group so and so. We cracked this game on this, this date, and we're saying hi to all our pals and see you at the copy party this weekend. And that just, you know, that just exploded. And I would say primarily in Europe. And so back to those copy parties, right? And, and we're talking late 80s. Um, and that was the prime way of spreading the latest stuff that you got your hands on. Um, and then enter modems. And that absolutely, I would say, propelled the world from, you know, you would get games from zero to seven days to zero day, right? Or one day, because it's now online and you can go pick it up and you'll download and it'll take 10, 20, 60 minutes to get the latest disc downloaded. So that in itself brought an evolution in the sense that these groups now started competing in terms of getting their crack on what was called the major BBSs or the major boards first, because a file listing not only is, is a repository, it is also a chronological re uh, representation as to how fast your board was or how fast a particular group got a crack out. So if you had group A who uploaded at 7 p.m. and group B was just a little bit slower and uploaded at 8 p.m., then group A by definition had won the race. And I have to say, if you, um, if you go into the early to mid 90s, that absolutely, um, got professionalized in a sense that people were were going to you know almost zero minute it's probably exaggerated there's a lot of competition to get games out as fast as possible which meant these groups went to extreme lengths to get what we were calling the originals the original source of the game as soon as possible right which meant you could no longer wait for your around the corner shop to have the game you'd go to a distributor or you'd go to somebody that works for a magazine, or even better, you'd know somebody in a software house and you'd get early releases of those copies. So those things really uh, took up in the early, mid to, sorry, the early to mid nineties. Uh, and I'd say that that degree of competitiveness also drove to your, you know, the, the theme of today drove the activity and the popularity of, of underground BBSs because that was where, that was the marketplace. That's where you would show up with what you had delivered and you had to get it first chronologically on the top BBSs in order to be recognized as the group that got that release out. Yeah, my name's uh, Death Row. I've been in the BBS scene and for many, many years. Uh, also had a, quite a few high-end duffels, affiliates, as you want to call them, you know, like Razor, Fairlight, many other groups, also food, I was more in, in the underground as in, you know, the wares. I was in the groups supplying, a uh, bit of cracking, you know, just a bit of everything. I used to run a run an FTP for the USHQ, vanished in the middle of the night. <laughs> done done quite a bit. There, there's different scenes. You've got the, you know, you've got the plain BBS scene where, you know, they've got their door games, they've got their message boards. Then you've got, you know, the more underground boards that were really wears orientated 
and also HPA orientated. I was more into the wares side of the game, as we'd say. This isn't more of a, of a BBS story. This this is more of a, a title release for a major group, and I was supplying it. But back in those days, we were on dial-up modems. I had to, you know, get the title to the cracker, and just the, and the speed just wasn't there. And we lost that race to the group named Class, and that that was that was a pain, you know. That was a big blow because. A lot of money gets involved and this is this is where people you know some people go oh you got to pay for on boards and that for access it, the money spent to get these titles is, is huge but it, these days it's a lot different it's all automated now like just say for an example a new title comes out on steam that title is bought instantly downloaded instantly cr automatically cracked automatically sent to an FTP server that's pretty much on the same network and bang it's released that's that's how it's done now and again like you mentioned that they could sometimes get source code and so forth and you know and that that's obviously a specific challenge in off its own but mm. um you know on the occasions and I guess most of the occasions where they didn't have the uh, ability to obtain the source code of the game they were taking the compiled game that you know could have been released or or was in at least a binary state a normal program and reverse engineering this copy protection mm. in the software right so this process of cracking the game and finding out sort of reverse engineering i guess was was very complex, wasn't it? It's not something you could just do in five minutes um, for the average no. programmer, anyway. No. Uh, and look, I'm I'm not a programmer myself, so I, I cannot go into the, the nitty gritty technical detail. And I, I don't think that's the purpose of today, anyway. Um, <clears throat> but to your point, right? In the cases where the actual source code was available, those cases are extremely rare. Right. It, it basically meant that the guy that was writing the game was also the guy that was leaking it to the scene. And that did happen, right? Because there was a, at one point, there was a very gray area between, you know, you're really good at what you're doing in the scene, right? You're, you know, you're great at programming demos. You're great at graphics. You're great at, at music or all three. Hey, chances were you were probably making, producing or contributing to a game at some point in time. So um there would be leaks from one world to the other uh but then obviously comes the realization hey when i'm doing this i'm selling less copies right so i think that gray area for sure went away probably around the same time frame. i would say mid 90s when um you know things got a little bit more commercial publishers started insisting on on more sales right you weren't thinking about hey if i sell a hundred of copies of my game i'll be rich right we're talking about thousands if not millions so that 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 gray area went away back to your question that means once the original right meaning the the, the final binary result of a game probably on a disc physically already uh was obtained the trick was to get it as fast as possible right and, and i i gave a few hints as to what was possible there either you had a distributor or a magazine that was reviewing it and had an early review copy or or anything and you, you know one group even had um somebody working in the, um, the copy factories right where the original came and it just reproduced thousands of copies before they got packaged so all of these were early access to a game before it was actually officially on the market but the trick was then still um to get it to your cracker and that's the the individual removing that mechanism as soon as possible and again bbs's would sit in the middle of that um at least in the early days uh, later on it was more like direct to direct you'd have that supplier that would get a copy and he would have a direct modem connection to the cracker who would then work on it as soon as possible and that cracker would put it on a bulletin board and then things would spread right as, as we would call it or or be distributed um how long it would take Look, if we think in, in, in the realm of copy parties, it didn't matter, right? The next copy party was next Sunday, right? So if you if you got a game on Monday, look, as, as long as it's done on Sunday, 
that's great. But as soon as things moved online, it was ASAP. And as soon as the competition kicked in, you didn't know whether your competitor had the same game on the same day. So you had to go as quickly as you could. Um, I would say the more complex protection definitely took longer. When they are cracking, they don't know how much it costs to write a game. Uh, writing a game will take one year, two years, but cracking a game will take week? one hour, one hour, maybe a week. Most of the time, one week hour. Top. But writing a game will go to two years. Yeah. Stupid. Most of the time, if you make a very good game, it takes a lot of time. Within two years, it's finished. And when they released it, they cracked in one hour, and it's in the privacy world, and software companies say, uh, can't sell the program anymore. Do you think there would be more higher sales of an original game if it wasn't cracked by yes, a lot yes. of groups? There's a lot of resources online where, where you can read. There's even videos on, on, on YouTube that you know take some of these old game protections and walk you through how, how it was circumvented in the end. And it shows you in 20 minutes what took two weeks, right? Some of these games definitely took that long. The majority, I would say, were, were cracked in under a day. Some of the more repetitive um, protection schemes were cracked in five minutes. There were even tools, right? Because one of those protections became so commercialized that many of the big houses used that protection by default. And therefore, as soon as it came out, the cracker would have a quick look and he'd say, okay, it's one of those. He, he didn't even have to look at it. He would just send a tool to the guy that had the original. The guy would run that tool and you'd have a cracked copy done. So it did go to that level of professionalism, if you could call it that, um, on particular protection. So yeah, from multiple days, if not weeks to five minutes or less. Yeah, it almost seems like it was an absolute losing battle for the publishers and, and, and the vendors. And, you know, if there was a piece of software worth cracking at that point in time, it would be cracked. Um, you know, yep. I guess some of that is still true to say today, but, uh, you know, making the encryption or the crack it, the um, the protection sorry of these uh, softwares was that is actually you know not trivial itself so it's, it's quite uh, it must be quite disheartening for these software publishers uh, and uh, authors to to put all of this effort into protecting their software um, and to have it cracked within minutes or days as you say yeah. so. there's many an example where um like I said, the gray zone, right? You're part of the scene and you're actually working on a game and you thought you were going to get rich and so forth and so forth. And these people would actually leave messages in their game. Like, you know, if you're looking at this, you're trying to remove the protection, get the F out of here, right? And there would actually be individual notes to particular cracker groups in there. Again, um, all of those notes are compiled somewhere nicely on a website online. Uh, and, and eventually, you know, not, there is not a protection that cannot be cracked. And the more it was boasted in the magazines, as in, this will never be cracked, yeah, the more emboldened, if I could use that word, the cracker groups were to do it as soon as possible. Uh, so, yeah, I, you know, from a, a moral compass uh, perspective, you know, most of the active people in, in, in the scene of, of that time were minors or young adults, probably don't realize the impact of what you're doing and you probably don't you know appreciate the impact it can have we, we obviously didn't have the mega corporations that we have now uh when it comes to gaming gaming as such wasn't such a billion dollar business as it is today so people are like yeah you know we've been doing this forever so how am i damaging it um but i think it would be it's absolutely fair to assume that there there had been an impact for sure yeah, uh, it's a it's a funny one. Um, I remember speaking to Ken Williams. I did an interview with him um, a while back. Ken Williams um, was uh, the the CEO of Sierra Online, and they made lots yeah. of games that were popular over the years. Um, one of them was Leisure Suit Larry, and um, yeah. they they knew that they were um, there was far more people copying their their game than actually selling it because they sold more of the guidebooks, uh, which yeah. is a, you know, an, an, a, an extra thing you could buy. They sold more copies of those than they actually sold of the software. So um, yeah. it, it certainly certainly was rife on every platform. And of course, like you say, yeah. it's just as long as there's software, or as long as there's going to be music or any sort of medium 
uh, really it's going to be copied. So uh, it's to be Correct. expected. The carding was really um, getting access to credit cards with name and expiration date uh, to then go online. Well, not online, use a magazine, uh, see what it is that, you, that you'd like, what was being sold. Let's say the new Amiga came out. You'd basically use somebody else's credit card to order that Amiga over the phone, have it delivered to what was called a drop site, right? Which meant not your home address. Uh, and you go pick up that Amiga and uh, it's yours, right? And obviously you haven't paid for it. So that's, that's the carding site. Um, carding was, a, was an interesting thing as, as you needed to have access to credit cards, which meant, you know, you either knew somebody working in a restaurant or, or a gas station and, and what have you, where these transactions would happen, or you would even have a, what was called a card generator, right? There's always an algorithm behind any of the major, well, back in the days, I, I don't know whether that's still today. Um, there's an algorithm that validates what a certain series of numbers gives you a certain checksum. And if it does, it's a valid credit card. Um, that's the means that people got their hands on, on credit cards and, and started doing all sorts of things with them, right? Ordering stuff was what I would say happened in the late eighties, um, early nineties. And lots of people made money with it. And lots of people got arrested for it and rightfully so, uh, cause that's just plain theft. Right. Uh, and, and there's nothing but victims in there, right? The guy who owns the credit card, who all of a sudden sees, I didn't buy an Amiga in Ireland, right? Uh, there's a credit card company who has to deal with it. There's the insurance company that has to deal with it. And there's the vendor, right? That, that sold the Amiga, shipped it to Ireland. Uh, and that is now getting a dispute. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy that that's a part of uh, the scene, if you will, that, uh, that was met with, with hard recourse. Um, but those, same credit cards were also being used to make those free phone calls I mentioned earlier. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that racked up a, a, bi a big bill for some of the credit card companies. So what do you, what do you think that um, all of the, the smaller ones, the people who, you know, they might not have got busted, um, but, uh, you know, certainly were quite nefarious and, um, and got, got into difficulty. A lot of them, like you said earlier, these people were young adults or, or even some of the cases, you know, they, they were still minors, um, you know, very talented, very clever people. What do you, what do you think has happened to them now? Uh, look, um, I, I'm, I'm in touch with some people that I knew from back in the day. Um, uh, let's just talk about about it in two ways one way would be you know where have they ended up in in life or what are they doing today and i, I would say it, it's just your average dissection of society right uh you know some of them got out don't even have a computer anymore and, and you know have, have fond memories and are a truck driver or a teacher or what have you um there are a number of 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 them that you know have turned this around and and actually do this for a living right so they either work uh, in technology, um, the more creative slash talented individuals, they work in, 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 in the gaming industry or write software. Um, so for sure, it, it, you know, in a way it's been a catalyst for them to, to understand that this is something where you could make money. And, and let's be fair, right? <clears throat> if you grew up in the nineties and you, you'd go to, to um, university in, in 1992, 1993, there's no such thing as computer sciences and, and, and all the stuff that is available today. So, you know, if, if you were into computers in, in 1992, 1993, probably that's a bit late, but you know what I mean? You were a nerd, right? It's like, that, that's a guy with thick glasses and, you know, bald like you and I both are, right? That sits in a room with dim light and, and what have you. So there was this, this, this idea around it. I, I'm, I'm glad that uh, some of them, some of us, I have to say, you know, took the plunge and said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to make a living out of this. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if, if any of the multimillionaires or maybe even multi-billionaires, I, I don't know for a fact, right, uh, that are out there and in Silicon Valley have somewhat of an underground knowledge or connection for sure. So that's, that's definitely one aspect of it. Um, <clears throat> another aspect is 
hey, some of us have started picking it up again, right? Because we, we miss um, that feeling, we miss um, the, the general sense of, of being on boards, right? It brought us together before, you know, IRC or chat or email and all of these things existed. And you've talked about that in, in your documentary. Thank you for that, by the way. Um, but there are individuals that are extremely nostalgic about it. And so um, the software that I was referring to earlier, uh, Mega Express or Amy Express, is now being developed again. And so there's probably a bunch of, I'd say two or three dozens of individuals who put a BBS back online um, and still have, you know, 20, 30 year old software on there that probably, you know, back then was hot stuff, not so hot today, and probably people don't care too much anymore. Um, just to get that feeling again. Look, you know, I've, I've got fun memories of it. Um, I loved it. I still love it today. It, it's obviously not what it was back in the day. Uh, but but I look back uh, to those days with, uh, you know, with great sympathy and uh, great emotions, actually. As you've seen in this video, the BBS was the first platform that brought thousands of individuals together across the world to form an underground cyber culture. Some individuals just chose to consume, such as downloading the latest ODA wares, and some were creators, whether that was being a cracker, wares distributor, or something like making blue boxes to freak with. In many cases, a lot of people involved were simply pimply-faced kids or young adults that just liked to mess around on computers and make names for themselves that didn't harm many. But some individuals involved clearly had nefarious motives. That's all for this episode of Back to the BBS. Still to come, we cover the ANSI art scene as well as music tracker and demo scenes. If you liked this episode, please check out the rest of the series so far. Give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Thanks so much to those of you who have donated to the channel, both on YouTube and on Patreon. Your continued support really does help. See you soon for the next part of Back to the BBS.